This one, yeah. You are now alive. <laughs> okay, folks, uh, we're moving to the second talk of this morning's uh, lecture program. And again, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Family Tree DNA for uh, sponsoring the fourth year of Genetic Genealogy Ireland and all the uh, volunteers from ISOG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy, who are helping out here at the, uh, in the lecture area and also downstairs at the Family Tree DNA stand. So a big thank you to our sponsors and to our volunteers. And uh, first up is John Cleary. And John will be talking about current developments in SNP testing for genealogical research. Uh, John teaches in a languages department at a university in Scotland and has previously taught in colleges and universities in Germany, Japan, Malaysia and the UK. So he has certainly been exposed to languages. <laughs> he has been involved in educational development projects on teaching modern European languages which have led him to travel widely in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And in a previous life he also worked in a museum and wrote a history of the people who had built and inhabited medieval almshouses. So, in recent years, there's been a huge explosion in the number of DNA markers available for testing on the Y chromosome, and as more and more people are taking up these advanced tests, our knowledge of the human evolutionary tree has expanded. Not only that, but the new SNP results, in combination with pre-existing SDR data, are creating branching patterns within surname projects and helping our understanding of the evolution of surnames within Ireland. John summarises these recent advances and shows us where they might lead. So please give a big welcome for John Cleary. Uh, thank you very much, Morris, and it's a real pleasure to be back here at Gen Genetic Genealogy Ireland for my third time. Uh, I've, been, I've been speaking here, and it's very nice to be back in this room, so it's a very nice room to present in. And I'd like to say good morning to all of you, actually good afternoon now to all of you, and uh, thank you for coming along to listen. Um, some of you may have heard um, talks I've given either here or in Birmingham about uh, uh, YDNA projects and SNP testing, and I think... What many people have said to me afterwards is, thank you very much, but it's quite a complicated area and be very useful to have um, a more sort of basic overview of how to go about exploiting uh, SNP testing for um, your family history research. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try and go through um, a procedure of how we can approach using SNP testing on the Y chromosome uh, for this. Um, in a more step-by-step -step way, so this can be more of a basic level talk. Um, but I think it's a good time to do this, because as Morris says, um, there are changes afoot. We don't really know what they're going to be yet, but we can smell change in the air. And things have been stable for about three or four years since the introduction of uh, affordable uh, next-generation sequencing tests, which allow you to sequence long chunks of the Y chromosome rather than sample just particular markers. And uh, I think we're just on the verge of seeing big changes that will lead to um, different ways of doing this and perhaps more uh, effective ways of doing it. Um, and so I'll try and talk about what some of these may be towards the end of the talk. I mean, I'm not going to suggest what the future will be. Um, it's my own speculation, and there are probably people in this room who know more about it than I do. But anyway, I'm going to begin by um, doing an overview of what the various kinds of Y-SNP tests are. Um, then I'll look at how we can set about building small projects and I view anything as a project, whether it's a large surname project with official, officially named administrators or just something which you're doing yourself, trying to investigate the history of your own surname um, by getting a few tests together. Um, I'll look at some cases from Irish and Scottish and actually Scots-Irish surname research to illustrate some of the questions and some of the things you can do with SNP testing and furthering research into those surnames. And then I'll, I'll give my, my own idle speculations about the future of, um, uh, of uh, Y-SNP testing. So, um, first of all, just looking at the, the various types of Y-SNP tests, there are three broad types of ways that you can test SNPs. Before I go on, are you all familiar with what I mean by SNPs? No. Um, well, 
This isn't quite a beginner's level course, I'm afraid, oh, I could talk, I'm afraid, um, but because um, many people in the room are familiar with the, uh, the STRs, the um, single tandem, what were they called, single tandem short, repeats? Short tandem, short tandem repeats, thank you, absolutely, short tandem, tandem repeat uh, markers, um, and the, um, I the problem again, Morris, the single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, which are the SNPs, um, and of course, there are two different types of, of marker on the Y chromosome. So a SNP, in, in very, very simple terms, is a single mutation in one place on a chromosome, any chromosome, and it pretty well stays there. Uh, most of these are, uh, at least in the historical time scale, permanent. So once one of these markers, mutations appears, it gets passed on to all of the descendants uh, of the person who has that first mutation. And therefore, they can become markers of genetic descent. So all a SNP is, don't worry about it if you're not familiar with the terminology, is a marker that's passed on. And as it's a Y chromosome, these are passed on from father to son down the direct male line. And of course, a big advantage of this is that it enables you uh, to do surname research since until the, 20, until the 21st century, surnames were also um, generally passed down along, along the male line. That may be changing, of course, um, which will be a challenge for future family history research, and why not? So anyway, back to the types of SNP testing then. So the aim is to um, discover what, what or which of these markers appear on your Y chromosome, or the Y chromosome, the person which you're testing. So um, the, the best way to do it um, is to do a sequencing test, which is here, um, in which long chunks of the Y chromosome are actually read, the whole thing. So whatever the, the sequence of bases on the chromosome is across that stretch, you read it and you come up with a sequence, a very, very long sequence of millions of sequences of the A, G, C and T letters, um, which will be your own particular unique sequence. Now, most of us who have Y chromosomes, that would be about roughly half the room, um, will um, have pretty well identical sequences. Um, in, 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 in their Y chromosomes. But there are small differences here and there, which are these markers of mutations that occurred in historical or prehistoric times that are passed down uh, through the ancestral line. And so these are what we're trying to find. And so by getting the full long sequence, you can then spot where these small, tiny differences are um, between you and somebody else that indicate that you have different ancestral um, paths. And also, of course, because mutations can appear um, down the generations, you may test yourself and your father, for example, and find that each of you has one small difference somewhere on the Y chromosome, which would be a unique mutation in you in, in that case. So the sequencing then aims to sequence, in theory, the whole um, chromosomal sequence. But in actual fact, today's tests can't manage that. They don't have the technology to do it to any, any, any great degree of, re of reliability. And therefore, what you have is targeted regions in which bits of the chromosome are sequenced fairly fully. Others are kind of partially sequenced, others not at all. So we have a kind of a mosaic of sequencing. It's still better than what we had before. Um, it's not quite a full Y sequence. Now, I gave a talk in Birmingham in Who Do You Think You Are um, this year, in, in April, in which I talked in more detail about the differences between the different sequencing tests. Um, and if you're interested in following this up, then uh, try and find the recording of that talk on, online, which, which Morris has placed online. And it's a slightly higher level talk that goes into more detail about the technicality. Today, what I want to do is talk more about how we can use these tests. The two more forms of um, SNP tests we're talking about um, single SNP tests have been around for a long, long time. In fact, they were the way in which SNPs were tested um, for most people um, doing this kind of research until a few years ago. And this is simply you try and find a very particular SNP. So you send off a DNA sample to see, do I have this SNP here? Uh, a very well-known SNP is called RL21. Uh, many of you who are Irish men in this room will have this. I do. Many of you will. Um, probably not, not, not all of you. Some of you will, will, have, will not have that. But it's a very, very common SNP. You can do a test to see if you have it. And the testing company will only test the little piece of your Y chromosome where that SNP is found to see if it's there or not there. So it's a single SNP test. And again, they're very, very useful for very particular kinds of questions. But you wouldn't want to try and sequence your whole Y chromosome that way. You'd have to be a billionaire to do that. Um, so they're a very slow and expensive process. So the great thing about next generation sequencing is it speeds up the whole process and makes it more affordable. Then, much more recently, we have the panels of known SNPs. And these are very, very useful because um, imagine if you do one of the more extensive next generation sequencing tests, you might discover a whole tray, a whole chain of new SNPs that exist in you and nobody else. 
which will be your private SNPs, as we call them, but most of these actually will be shared with other people that you're, you're related to, who may not have tested yet. And of course, you can go to them and say, I did this, this um, NGS test, what did you do as well? Uh, do you have $500? Mm-hmm. They might say, no. Uh, unsurprisingly. But if you say, do you have $99 or $119 to see if you share these SNPs that I have, that, that's a more affordable prospect. And it means that you could um, follow up your own test by more limited testing of other people uh, who are believed to be connected to you and who may share these SNPs to see whether or not they do share them. And as we we'll see later on, this enables you to start building descent trees. So these three types of um, SNP tests are complementary to each other. They all serve different purposes. You wouldn't yourself take a sequencing test and a panel test. There's no need because the sequencing test only includes SNPs found in the panel tests. So um, be very, very careful. Make sure nobody you're involved with or working with tries to take a panel test having taken a next generation sequencing test. But you may get your relatives to do that, and you yourself may want to come back later on to investigate further some of the um, SNPs you found uh, in, in your own NGS test. And one way to do this is to take a single SNP test to just make sure that something you found that maybe has a slight question mark over it actually is a justifiable uh, discovery. So these, yes, please. When you say NGS test, do you mean something like big Y? I'm trying to avoid being company specific here. Yes, I uh, will we'll mention that in a later slide, maybe the next one actually, um, which the two big NGS tests are. But yes, yeah, so at the moment there are two companies, in fact, I think it's the next slide. Oh, you hear what? Because it's obvious. There are two companies currently selling commercial direct to consumer um, NGS tests, which are the big Y family tree DNA and the the Wileys 2, I think 2.1 now actually, of the Full Genomes Corporation. Um, And they're both both very good tests. They have different strengths and weaknesses. And um, there's a very sharp debate amongst project administrators about which is better to take. There's probably no doubt that this one is a better test overall, but it will hit your bank balance far harder um, than the big Y test. The big Y saves costs by um, targeting regions and doing what we call capture testing, trying to capture particular parts of the, uh, the Y chromosome where useful SNPs are thought to be. And again, the Y chromosome is very up and down. Some parts are very useful. Some are actually not very useful for this kind of testing. So the big Y aims to get the, the parts that, as far as it can that are useful. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot quicker. They turn these around in three or four weeks, whereas these can take several months. So this is for the purists, but again, it's not to be ignored, because um, if you want to seriously research your own um, genetic ancestry, you may find that actually some of the SNPs that are crucial to your line lie in areas not tested by the big Y, and therefore you would currently need this test in order to define them. Now, I've taken this one. Um, I think this one was good enough for what I was trying to do, and I sort of recommend people I'm working with to also take this one, because if you catch um, the family tree DNA sales at the end of the year, you can always get two of these, the price of one of these, which means you can do what's very important in SNP testing research, test two people who come from the same cluster to then see which SNPs are shared and which ones are not shared by the two. Um, Obviously, that will cost you an awful lot more to do it with this. Um, Eventually, I will do something like this. I'm not going to do this one. I'm going to wait for something better to come along. Um, Because I would like to see my whole Y chromosome sequence. I'd like to have my whole whole, um, DNA sequence, actually. And that's what I'm waiting for. At the moment, these are the two choices. And here are two companies again, which do SNP packs and single SNP testing. Family Tree DNA do all three. They do all three types of tests. And they're they're very responsive at the moment to creating and improving their panel tests based on the discoveries from the the big Y tests. So if you're working at a deep level of trying to investigate um, a haplogroup, a much older um, um, grouping of, of related individuals with a much older direct ancestor. Family Tree DNA are now currently uh, very willing to put together special panels for those groups. And then a company down here, YSeq, a very small, very mobile company based in, in Berlin, in Germany, um, who also do single SNP testing at a very low cost. Um, and I, I go to them for any single SNPs that I want to confirm um, in the groups I'm working with. Um, and they also do their own SNP panels using a different technology to family tree DNA. So again, there's a, there's a rainbow of test types and technologies, um, but all of these have a, a role to play in the current sort of ecology of SNP testing. 
Um, and it's very interesting to see what's going to change because I think these companies would expect would be the ones who would lead that change as well. So those are the companies which we can use. I'm going to look, um, I said I'm going to talk about how to go about setting up your own project. So I've got together a little sort of flow chart that will show you the, the steps that you can go through. And the first question you need to ask is, do you, if you're interested in testing yourself or a relative of yours or a friend of yours, do you have a surname project with a large set of STR matches. So there are many very old surname projects that are very large and developed a um, lot, lot of data from the STR tests. Um, if, you, if the answer is yes, then can you identify the branches of this uh, family lineage using the data you have already? If the answer to that again is yes, then find a test candidate within each branch. That's relatively simple because um, you want to find out what are the unique SNPs of each of the branches you've identified. So if you're in this lucky position, you can move fairly quickly to uh, a single SNP, to um, SNP testing. If you can do single SNP or panel testing, if you do that, check the, the reads you get. Or, of course, you can go to NGS testing, in which case you should then move on to get the raw data. You can't do very much with the results as given you um, in most of the testing sites. Well, it's certainly Family Tree DNA's uh, results page. If you get the raw data files from Family Tree DNA, you can do a lot with those files. So that's just the, the beginning stage. Most of us are not in this happy position. So uh, I certainly wasn't when I first started. And I think many of you, if you're interested in this kind of research, may also not be in the position of already being part of a large STR-based surname project. So what then do we do? Well, you can ask, do you have close STR matches? Now, you can't do the big Y test in particular if you haven't already done STR testing. So you will know if you have already STR matches who share your surname. And of course, if that's the case, there's a fair chance they will be um, related to you. And you can use SNP testing to investigate whether they are and how closely they are. If you don't, then you've, the only thing you do is SNP test yourself. And that's more or less the position that I was in when I tested myself because I almost had no one I could call a close match and certainly not sharing my surname. If you do, then test yourself and one of the matches. We get the most value from these tests by comparing results. So, in a sense, if you only test yourself, you're hoping that something else may come up. Chances are, if you don't have any STR matches, you're not going to have any SNP matches either, because they'll all be too distant, too far away from you. But it's still a start um, on the process by testing yourself, as I did. But it's better still if you have a match that you can test along with you, and then you have a comparison you can set up. You may have STR matches, close STR matches, with a mix of surnames. This, of course, is very, very common for many of us. You, I mean, often we can identify <coughs> obvious uh, NPEs, non-parental events, people who uh, don't have a surname but are clearly connected to you through some kind of slip between sheet and bed in the past. Or alternatively, there may be a whole range of um, different surnames mixed in that may give a rather confused origin picture. And we'll look at a case uh, like this a bit later on. If that's the case, once again, try and find SNP candidates. And if you've got several surnames with several members each all mixed in together, you want to investigate why those several surnames are coming together in your matches list. And therefore, ideally, you'd want a testing candidate from each surname group. If you can see branches within them, try and find a testing candidate from each branch within each surname. Of course, the costs mount up here. This, is, this can be an expensive process. You can do it gradually over time. Um, collect tests, process them, find out what they mean, then contact more testers and gradually build up more and more data. Um, when I first came here two years ago, I showed the people who were here that day a very rudimentary um, tree chart um, from the group which I was working on. In the two years since then, we now have more than 50 um, big Y results and several SNP panel results in that grouping. And we have a much more elaborate tree, which I'll show you later on. And it's taken two years to reach there, um, but we're now seeing the results of that, uh, of that long period of investigation. So once then you've done um, the test again, you have to either get your raw data, um, process them, compare them, or of course get the positive reads from the, the single panel SNP tests. So we'll look at the, the data side of things later on. For now, I'm going to start by looking at these different cases. So 
I'm going to begin with my case study number one, um, which is just about here. This is for the um, the surname, the person who has no matches. That's me. Uh, originally. So when I first did an STR test, I had no matches at all. I added one person who matched me at 2 out of 25, but he didn't match me at a higher level. I was 18 out of 111. So um, he wasn't really a close match, although he believed he was. I, I never really thought that was likely. Um, the surname was wrong as well. So my surname is Cleary. Um, his surname was Gorman. And um, the one thing that led to think there probably was some connection was the fact that both of us track back, trace ourselves back to South Tipperary, so the area between Care and, and the Cork border. So um, clearly our two families were living in close proximity uh, for quite a long time. They're definitely there in the 19th century. They've probably been there for centuries, actually, um, I think, I think many, many centuries. So the question was, how did I come to have a closest match who was called Gorman? Why do I have not have any matches of my own? Well, the second question is actually quite interesting and fairly easy to answer when you think about it. My family probably was not one that had very much immigration to, to the US. The vast majority of STR testers in, in the database today are, are American. Um, and I think 70% or so are some of the, one of the figures I've heard. And if you're part of an Irish family that's had very heavy migration to America, the chances are some of your descendants will have tested and begun to find relatives back in Ireland as well if they've tested. In our case, I suspect we probably haven't had, had very much of that. And uh, Therefore, there are, there are few clearies related to me um, in the US who are testing, therefore a lower chance of finding people who are connected to me through this. Um, secondly, the, the Gorman, well, that, that probably is a family that went to America that the Gorman I'm related to is, is based in the US. So that, their family clearly was affected by migration. But all of the Gormans in uh, his study, there are quite a few of them, come from America or Australia, and there are none so far from Ireland. So that, that's the, the first thing. Um, so what I decided to do was set about finding somebody else I could test. Um, I'd done my own, my, my own testing, uh, including Big Y, and I was still a singleton, apparently no close uh, relatives um, for about 4,000 years. I had this kind of last of my tribe sensation. So what I did was I went out and sought a potential tester. And in Tipperary, there's a Cleary family. Um, my father grew up in, uh, in Clonmel and often visited um, a cousin, also called Cleary, a cousin of, of his father. Um, and um, when I asked him, my father, well, what kind of cousins are they? No one actually knows. First, second, not first, probably not second, third, maybe fourth, maybe, just cousins, just cousins. So <laughs> I mean, we don't actually know who, the, who the, uh, the most recent common ancestor is. So this particular line can get back to about 1825. I can get back further because I've gotten very lucky. Uh, our, our line happens to know of a, a gravestone in uh, Rochestown in, uh, in Tipperary that's guarded by a very fearsome bull. So no one gets near to take it down. And that gives, gives us these two people, um, I connect to him through parish records, and then we get two more generations from the gravestone. So I can get back to the, the 18th century, which is um, not the case for, for many Irish families. And my, my cousins can, can get back to this Thomas Cleary. So we, we know that there are some potential candidates, there's at least two, who could be uh, the ancestor who connect into to my line um, and who don't quite have the right dates um, to be um, the, the Thomas Cleary who my cousin descends from. Um, but maybe, you know, as we all know, dates in uh, parish records and birth records and marriage records are not exactly fully reliable. Um, people often seem to be a bit younger than they really were once you find their birth record. And we do have the marriage record of the Thomas Cleary here. Um, and it, you see, it tells us he was born in, as he was married in 1874, it was his second marriage. And uh, at the time he was 50 years old, at least that's what he was telling people. Um, and so therefore we think that's the, the probable date, but it, he's probably not this man, this one's probably almost certainly too young, but he could be this one, it's always possible. So, uh, what to do? Well, so I, I invited um, a descendant from this family to um, take a 37 marker test. And I actually um, came last year to GGI and talked about this, and I gave the results on that 37 marker test. It was actually very interesting, um, because it's not immediately clear if we are related or not. And I'll ask you the same question I asked last year in a moment, see if you agree with last year's crowd. So this is the STR results. And um, you see here that we match on 33 of the 37 markers, which is just about on the margin of what Family Tree DNA would say is a, a match indicating relationship. But unfortunately, one of the markers that we differ on, we differ by a huge three steps. So 
Technically speaking, we call the genetic distance between us is the sum total of all our differences, which is 6. 6 out of 37. And that's actually quite a high difference. Um, so um, this, this apparent cousin called Cleary from the right of the Tipperary still doesn't appear in my uh, family tree DNA account as a match. So because he's beyond the threshold of relationship. So can I say, what do you think then? Do you think that we are related, um, I and this uh, other Cleary and Tipperary, given that it's um, 6 out of 37 difference on the... Um, the so-called stepwise model, which counts all differences, or just 4 out of 37 difference on the so-called infinite alleles mod uh, model, which only counts the um, numbers of markers you differ on. So can I ask you a quick show of hands? How many, how many of you think that I and this other Cleary are related in reasonable historical time? Thank you very much. How many of you think we are not related? Thank you very much. Right. I mean, you're, 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 you're very brave. You always see where I'm leading with this. Uh, last year, it was 50-50. It's very interesting that the audience did split pretty well 50-50, saying yes and no. Um, of course, since last year, I've gone and done a, a big Y test on the other Cleary. And I now know the results. And what I see in the big Y test is a lot more resolution um, in this question. This block of red here is me and the other Cleary. And we share all of these. So all these SNPs are shared by us, um, right down to just one that I have and he doesn't. So in the time since our lines diverged, there's been time for my line to pick up one more SNP, and there's been no more private SNPs in, in his line. And this is based on analysis, by the way, from those who are familiar with um, the various resources for analysing uh, Alex Williamson's Big Tree and Wifel.com. I've used both and done my own reading of the BAM files to see which of these SNPs are shared and which are not. So this actually is pointing to a very strong picture of relationship. So the Clearies, I think, definitely are related. In historical time, what I can't really do is put a date on it. You see I've got a little timeline across over here. And I'm going to leave it sufficiently vague that this bottom line could be somewhere anywhere between 16, 1700 or, or 1800. I don't think that Thomas Cleary, 1813, is the man. I think probably um, our common ancestor is going to be a little bit further back and maybe just too far back to find him through parish records. But we, we can show at least that we are genuinely um, cousin lines and whatever my father and his family believed when they were visiting them in Clonmel in the um, 1950s, they were definitely cousins. And that's good enough, isn't it? That's all we need, really. Um, <laughs> we don't need to know exactly what number of cousin that is. Now, over here we have the, the Gorman line. Yeah, so that was, that's the interpretation. So around about here, I think before 1800, most likely. The, the, um, the Gorman tester has also very kindly uh, big Y tested this year, and we're still working on his results. Um, they are now in the, the big tree, uh, not yet in wifel.com. And um, he believed a long time that, that Cleary was a, a Gorman NPE, and I sort of swallowed my pride and said, yeah, okay, fine, that probably is the case, isn't it, yeah. Uh, we simply found a Cleary tenant living on a Gorman landlord's farm in the 1800s. Well, mm, yeah, it's going to go down here. But actually, no, no. The, the, the connection, I think, between us must go back a long way because these are the, the, the private SNPs we found in the Gorman tester. And there's a lot of them. And dating SNP branching is very, very difficult and very fraught with danger. I have to um, do warn anybody who tries this that we have to um, have a very wide margin of error around any kind of dating. But um, my estimate is that well, our lines divided in the Dark Ages. I've got an estimate here of around 600 CE, or possibly before. So we are, we are talking about a very, very deep branching um, between uh, us and them. And very likely we may have lived in the same part of Ireland for all the centuries ever since, which is interesting. Um, although maybe we just moved there from somewhere else around the same time. That's also possible. So um, this is, uh, has actually answered some of the questions then in, uh, in um, my first case. Um, so I pursued these testing candidates, persuaded them to test, and um, got the results of now answer questions that were thrown up by previous tests. And what I hope to do in the future is find more um, clearies in particular to flesh this out. I do know one family in uh, Illinois um, who I'm trying to um, contact, and I hope in time to find more testing candidates. So you may need to do this to make best, best advantage of these um, testing types, you need to have a question to pursue, and you often need to make, go ahead and make those contacts to find the people who can answer those questions by taking these tests. So to move on then, um, look at case two. Case two is what happens when you have a, I think I have the whole thing here, I'll just run this through quickly. 
Yeah, it's when you have. Um, Yes, case two is actually the yes that comes off here. It's when you have a, a large surname um, lineage based on, on STRs, but actually not having very much um, clarity in the way of branching. So I'll just quickly show a very interesting surname I'm um, working at the moment, or, or actually hearing about um, the person who's working on it, who's very active um, in, in this research, which is the Cochrane uh, family. Um, and they trace their origins to Derry, and possibly before that to Renfrew in Scotland. And so th there is documentary evidence of a Cochrane who moved from the Renfrew, from Renfrewshire to Derry um, in, the, in the early 17th century. And we have a very large Cochrane lineage um, which has got very, very similar STR values that suggest they also descend from an ancestor with a vintage of around about 1600 or so. And so some of them have got a certain degree of documentation that suggests that they may descend from this Derry uh, ancestor. And they've also found Cochrane's still living in, in Northern Ireland, um, who they've, they've tested. So um, you see here the, the distribution of the surname. It's, uh, oops, it's, it's very much a Northern di distribution. Um, and of course in Scotland, um, there's two different spellings of Cochrane here, but they tend to be concentrated largely around um, this uh, West Coast area. South of Glasgow, and here's Renfrew here, the Renfrew here. So, this um, Cochrane family then have um, done very extensive STR testing, and I don't think they have an awful lot of show for it, in the sense that they um, clearly have got a lot of similarity, so they can demonstrate the existence of their, of their lineage, they're clearly all re re related to each other, whoever the ancestor was. Um, but they have a lot of um, singleton markers, like these here, which don't actually... Um, which aren't terribly useful for making branches because they could occur at any time when the first um, sub-ancestor broke off the branch or in the, um, the tester himself. Um, there's a couple here, which, like this for example, which may allow you to construct a possible branch. There's not much here in the way of branching information. So um, this, I think this lineage really is ripe for some quite serious um, uh, SNP testing, particularly using um, the, the big Y test. And some of them have actually big Y tested, and they begin to get more distinction and a clearer branching pattern. So already, um, three people with the name Cochrane or, or variants have tested, and have already found a division. Um, so there's one branch here, uh, and a fairly recent common ancestor here, and this probably is around about 1600, so we expect with more testing to find more branches coming off here, and maybe a sub-branch or two. And over here we have some name of man, who's in the, the Cochrane um, project, I think the the man test was here, and who again appears to have fairly um, similar um, STR patterns to the Cochrane's, but now the SIP testing has shown that he actually connects a much further time back, probably around about 11 or 1200, so sometime in the medieval period before surnames were adopted, and probably before the original Cochrane ancestors had also taken that, um, that surname. So I think, although this is very much in its, in its beginning, in its, in its infancy, they have that huge STR lineage to draw upon. And um, I think they're now working on trying to identify more potential testers to try and bring more hierarchy and structure into the test here. Um, and of course, there are many big surname uh, lineages that have gone a long way in doing this, uh, one of which is the Irvin um, surname project. James Irvin at the back here has gone further than most of us in, in using STR and SNP testing to um, build a structure, a family structure uh, for his project. Uh, I think the Cochrane's have potential to follow that on a slightly smaller scale, and I think they will do so over the coming years. The SNP testing also lets us see who our deeper ancestors are. And of course, you may or may not be interested in deep ancestry, maybe genealogy maybe um, is what is driving you, but I think the, the Cochrane's have discovered some quite interesting things because they've discovered that they are also connected to other uh, family um, lineages who are testing within the same haplogroup, um, including a large uh, family group called Cooley. The Cooleys do not know where they, where they came from. Um, I'm sure many of you know that Cooley is uh, an Irish name. Um, it's found over in Mayo, I believe. Um, it's also an English name, uh, I think, with, with different origins. And these Cooleys may um, come from Lancashire. And they also connect with a tester named Hackett, um, who can trace his ancestry back to Derbyshire. And uh, there's some evidence suggests that he may be of Norman origin. So this could be um, a Norman, um, potentially, or, or Flemish origin group here. And the Cochrane's who are in Scotland are connected to this group who seem to have possibly 
again, very hypothetically, more southern route into, into the Isles. And going back further still, they've also found that they are connected to another large um, family lineage, uh, which is the, the Tucker family from Devon, possibly from Devon. Again, they can prove ancestry back to London, and they believe before that they're of Devon origin. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure what the evidence is on that so far. Um, and the, the Tuckers are also closely connected to a Norwegian <coughs> family, um, here, here uh, represented by this test over here. And for all of these lines, once you draw them back, we'll find there's a mix of Norwegian, mostly Swedish, and uh, Irish lines. And I'm looking forward to hearing a talk this afternoon, I think, um, from Peter Shulland here, the front, who will talk about uh, Swedish and Irish DNA. And I, I look forward to that. Um, so, Again, this, this is fascinating because I think it tells us something not only about deep origins but also about potential migration. Do you have a question? Uh, does your study extend to Europe as a whole, to France, France, and other countries? We have two people in this particular group from Germany. Um, we have none from France. In fact, almost all of the people in this grouping, I'll show a map later on, are from Ireland or uh, the UK or from Norway, Sweden, Finland, and two from Germany. We have some Welsh too, yes, we have some Welsh, yeah. Um, there, there, are very, there are relatively few attesters from France and Germany. Um, I mean, I suspect that there will be some from France, but uh, they haven't tested yet. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I, I can't say much about France at the moment. Um, I, I know that so we need more French testers, um, but I've been sort of looking northwards um, more recently. Yeah, thank you for that. So, um, then this, again, this is case two then, large, large surname lineage, not much distinction in terms of branching within the STR tests, but here SNP testing is opening up a much more hierarchical tree and actually demonstrating connections. Now, some of these coolies were popping up as matches in the, the Cochrane tests. Here clearly we can see that the SNP testing sorts the STR results into clear branches with a much older lineage. And therefore we now know that the coolies do relate to the Cochrane's but only about 1,500 years ago. That's the time scale which we're looking at here. So I put it a distant, deep relationship. So that's the, um, the second test then, the second case. The third case um, is um, convergence, what we call convergence between surname families. So this is the case when, here we go, you may have um, close STR matches showing a mix of surnames. And again, how can you approach this? I'm sure many of you found this. Those of you who have lots of matches might find actually that there are some with your surname and lots who don't have your surname. Do we ignore the ones um, that have different surnames? I think we shouldn't. We need to ask questions about why they're in there, as with the Cochrans and Cooleys. Um, the relationship there was clearly a deeper ancestral uh, relationship, and the two STR results have converged since then. And if you have lots of surnames in your STR matches, it may again be a matter of convergence. And SNP testing can sort this out. So, I have an example here. Um, this, again, is from um, my own family research. Those of you who have seen my talks in the last two years will be rather bored hearing about the Kemps and the Cummings, but here they are again. Um, this is um, from the matches of a relative of mine um, whose name is Kemp, and therefore there are lots of Kemp matches all the way down. But he's also picking up matches called Jacobs here and here, and one here called Cummings. And other people in the, the Kemp group had even more Cummings matches. So Kemp, Cummings, Jacobs seemed to be co-occurring and looked as if they were um, a closer related group in some way. Certainly the STRs can't tell us that they're not. So STR testing isn't able to sort these uh, family groups out. But SNP testing can do that. So a little bit of information about this. This is the, uh, the Kemp um, surname, which is a certain distribution. Um, very particular parts of Ireland, Cavan, mainly Limerick and Cork. Um, and then in, in the UK, it has a, a very sort of interesting distribution, really. Common in Scotland, common in the east, southeast of England, um, and down in Cornwall, um, but not really in between. So it almost looks like it's got a coastal um, connection here. Um, certainly, they're probably surnames of different origins in the two parts of Scotland. Um, they may be brought in. By, um, from other parts of Europe, because Kemp is also found in the Netherlands and Denmark in particular. So there are variants of Kemp elsewhere in Europe. Um, here's the Cummings distribution. Again, um, two distributions in Scotland, a very west coast distribution and a very northeast distribution. Um, and then Ireland, again, has a very particular pattern that will tell um, many of us that it, it's probably associated with Scots-Irish 
um, supplements. So um, again, many of the Cummings are, that we find on our matches list do indeed have ancestry from the north, um, but they don't, um, most of them, have any connection they can prove to Scotland. So the Scottish connection is more than hypothetical, um, and it could well be that actually they've adopted a Scottish name, but have been in Ireland for much longer, and therefore are not necessarily Scottish, just because the name they carry is of Scottish origin. So how can we, how can we approach this then? Well, we want to try and build trees from SNP results. And um, again, um, unlike the, the this, this is the Cummings STR list now, um, and unlike the, um, the Cochrane one I showed you, there's some very good clear patterns of branching here. It's a nice shared marker here, um, over here for the shared markers. And so we were able to build some interesting branches uh, for the Cummings, which held us fine testers who then took the big white. And uh, just to highlight these, we'll get through this quickly. And what it meant is, we're at, because they also have quite good information about their um, ancestry here, we can actually begin combining the SCR information, the, the SNP information, and the genealogical knowledge um, that these people had to begin building trees from all three sources of information. So if you try and build a tree only from SNP data, this is what you, this is what, what, what you end up with. This is the Cummings um, tree uh, based on nine big Y tests and one panel test. And again, there's a nice bit of hierarchy for this branch here. They, they have a clear sense of branching um, over the past 300 years or so. But these people here just stretch right back to the, uh, the, the original ancestor. And the um, big Y testing hasn't been able to differentiate the branches for them. So we need to turn to other forms of information to see whether we can find connections there. Certainly, uh, the big Y test hasn't been able to find the, the key SNPs that may help us build, build branching there. Maybe other forms of uh, NGS test will. But um, Whoops, it's gone again. This is um, a tree you can build from STRs. So this is using STR data. Um, and actually you can see that this tree appears to be slightly more fine-grained than the, the SNP tree. But of course, we can't rely on this because we don't necessarily know there hasn't been convergence in some of these STR branches. So we need the SNP tests to confirm and refine the, the branches which we're building with STRs. And once we have the SNP data, you then use that SNP data as the background um, or backbone for your tree, and then you begin to add in STR information within the ends of the lines. So the STR information can begin to refine what you have in, for example, these very long branches here and here that don't seem to have much differentiation. And so doing this, um, and I'll do this quickly because I did a longer version of this in, in Birmingham, you can begin to build a tree using um, SNPs. So these are all, all the SNPs in the branch appearing here, and STRs. So here we have a very common STR that's shared by all people in, the, in this branch and seems to be quite stable for hundreds of years. And all the ones in purple then are STR markers, some of which, um, some of which correlate certain SNPs and others of which follow on from certain SNPs. And then you can begin to add in information uh, from the genealogy, and there are still questions to ask. So here we weren't quite sure, for example, where this person should fit in because he shares one of, one of these patterns but not the other. So it could go on either line here. Um, and in the end, with this, these red dotted lines, this question was solved um, through further SNP testing. Um, and then genealogy, when another person came along, tested the Y, had more genealogy, and then we found that this person here must therefore connect here. There we go. So this is, this is possible for all large family lineages. If you have a degree, if you have STR testing done already, if you have a degree of genealogical knowledge, and if you're able to do several big Ys across the cluster. We have nine here, which is perhaps slightly more than we needed, but it has given us some very uh, fine data to work with. Um, and we do the same for the, the Kemp's, this is the, the Kemp family, which I descend from on my maternal side. Um, and as you see, these are all Kemp's, there are no Cummings or Jacobs here. And then we worked on the Jacobs family as well. The Jacobs family all descend from one known ancestor who was a migrant to um, Maryland in the 1660s. And so all of these people knew that they were descended from him, from the STR testing, but didn't necessarily know how they descended from him. So we're beginning to get some um, refinement in these lines uh, using STRs and SNPs here in green. But we do, we do need more of it. So we need to have more um, big Ys. Ideally, we'd like to see one from each of these branches, which each descend from a son 
of um, the original founder. And then we begin to see to what extent these snips we've found here are shared or not shared, and how they help to build up uh, a descent pattern uh, for this Jacobs family. That's their own internal research. What I'm also interested in, though, is working out to what extent these three family groups were related, as the STR suggested. And in fact, they're not, at least it's, it's rather like the Coolies and the Cochrans. Their relationship goes right back, um, I'm estimating, to um, not quite 250 BC, to about 750 CE. Um, so again, a, a Dark Age connection <laughs> seems likely here. And what, what we also find is that the Cummings line here um, has an older um, common ancestor than the other two families. In fact, the, um, the shared SNP for these two families um, was appearing around about the time the Cummings family was beginning to break up. So that the most recent common ancestors for Kemp and each for Kemp and Jacobs was around right about the same time, probably around about roughly 1600 or so. And therefore we now see a separate tree for each of the three families and how they relate to each other. So this tree then is sorting, or the SNPs are rather sorting the STR data we had before into a clear tree structure. And again, this is possible for, uh, for your um, family history research as well. So there's are three, three um, case studies then. Um, how would you have a time, Maurice? Okay, right. So um, once you've done your um, test, and a half. Two and a half. Okay. Once you're in your test, you need to get um, the, uh, the raw data and process it. And I've gone into this in more detail in the talk again in Birmingham um, in April. So if you're interested in that, go and look at the test. At the sake of time, I'll, I'll jump on here um, through this. Um, I've mentioned three types of tests at the very beginning. So again, see this complementary. Um, ideally, try and find two members in your family cluster who will do an NGS test if they can afford it, like Big Y or the full genomes test. Um, and then sort your data into trees, as I've done, showing the tree patterns of shared and single SNPs. But then you might want to consider retesting some of those key SNPs. Some of them may be a bit dubious or questionable, not quite clear. Maybe they appear in one person or two or three people in your group, but not one person. You need to double check whether that negative is a real negative, for example. And you can do this through um, single SNPs of single SNP testing, and then you can expand uh, your research by creating um, panels of SNPs, uh, which you then offer to other people that you, you suspect are related to you to expand your, your tree. The main problem is, uh, the, the main issue really, is if you want to get more of this kind of research, you need to actively expand that tree yourself by finding testers who will help you expand the tree by testing more and more branches. So just to um, finish, because I was asked to talk about the future um, with this, I'm actually not going to talk about um, this far. I'm going to talk about the future, go back my last maps here. This is a full flow chart anyway, which will be available, um, I can send this to anybody who wants to look at this, and it'll be on the recording of the talk. And um, just so to end then, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, the prospects for the future. Um, and I think, I'm sure the people in this room who know better than I do what may be coming. But Family Tree DNA are about to have a conference um, at which we may have announcements about the new shape of the Big Y test. So there are many challenges in SNP testing. Um, the Big Y has inconsistent coverage in both the depth of the coverage and how much the Y chromosome it covers. Um, the other test has issues over expense and the time it takes to turn the test around. And of course, the two may be mutually contradictory. So you can speed the test process up by testing less, or you can test everything but make it slower and more expensive. Um, and there are questions over um, the, the reliability of the calls and the, the tools to analyze results, which are not always as user-friendly as they, as they could be. Um, and we also know from NGS testing that there are something like 500 STRs which are being, um, which you can find in your Big Y results and your FGC results. So can the testing companies begin to leverage more of these um, additional STRs? At the moment, as you know, the, the, the largest STR panel is 111 markers available for family tree DNA. Maybe if we had 500 marker panels, we'd get much more fine branching right down through our, our family networks. So, Family Tree DNA then are going to, to announce soon, um, some, I believe, some changes to the Big Y. I've no idea what they are. These are only my idle speculations. 
Um, but it could include some of these, or maybe we'd like it to include some of these. Um, generating the, the haplotree tree they have dynamically from results, rather than um, us having to contact them and say, please add this SNP to your tree. Um, can they do as wifel.com do with their database and grow a tree uh, dynamically and automatically? Um, just getting over some of these, um, can they increase the amount of the Y chromosome being targeted? So there's a, a wider coverage for the test. We'd really like this, because we do know there are useful SNPs on parts of the Y chromosome not being covered. Can they increase the, the length of each fragment that they read, which means you can then capture more STRs and more accurate reading of the SNPs they're finding. And of course, we'd like um, better tools for understanding the results to be presented. And of course, we want all of this to be for the same cost, or better still, less. less. <laughs> we want all this, we want it now. So um, that, that's fine, Judith. We'll watch the announcements next month from FDDNA. I'm sure they were disappointed on everything. Um, more long term, um, whole genome sequencing is start, has started, and people are taking WGS tests. In other words, rather than target certain parts of one chromosome, read the whole thing. Um, and um, what we call 4x and 10x, that is, um, tests with a that, that read each position an average of four times, or read each position an average of ten times, are already available at lower costs than the big Y. But these resolutions are not enough uh, for the kind of research we're doing, because the, we, we can't be sure that any SNPs discovered um, will be reliable enough to demonstrate as a SNP. So we need a lot of retesting if we're relying on the, these resolutions. But when WGS tests with higher resolutions come along, they will certainly, I think, knock the, 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 um, the single chromosome tests out of the way. Um, there are, of course, huge challenges in um, building relational databases that can do the many-to-many -many comparisons. In other words, you're talking about three billion um, base pairs on, on each of our genomes, and we have to compare three billion with three billion every time um, a comparison has been done. And this is massive. Um, I'm not sure if it, if it can be done um, at a reasonable cost yet, anyway. Um, but of course, in the future, uh, it may well be that the tests that people take will all be WGS. So you send your sample in, and everything will get read. And then what we may do, we may find ourselves buying bits of that back from the testing company. So you want to know where your Y SNPs are, then, then you buy the bits that will give you your, your Y SNPs. You want to know um, or, um, your autosomal DNA, again, you can buy that from them as well. So that might be a way in which we, we see this proceed in an affordable way. So the testing itself is not the expensive part. It's the maintenance of the infrastructure around that that's more expensive. Um, and in the looking long term, not, not very long term, it's coming. It's, it's on us. Um, fourth generation sequencing um, or or different ways of um, sequencing the, um, the, the Y chromosome to allow the sequencing to be done as the sequencer reads the sequence. The moment um, MGS involves a kind of breaking up of your, of your chromosome into a mosaic or a jigsaw of bits which are then reassembled by, by, by a very clever software. So future um, systems may be able to read as they go along um, or also have longer read lengths which allow capturing of all those STRs, which I'm not quite sure about, and more reliable capturing of SNPs, and also of all the difficult areas of the white chromosome that can't be sequenced very easily. So um, this may lead to more accurate calling of some of the SNPs that we do have now that may not necessarily be 100% reliable. And this is actually already with us. So the Full Genome Corporation are already piloting their whole genome long read pilot um, and there's no information about this. Some projects um, have um, sent pilot tests to this, so it's under kind of a beta testing stage. Um, but it is actually on the FGC website if anyone wants to go and buy it and has, wait for this, $2,750 to spare, then, then you can order this test. Of course, it will get cheaper and quicker. But um, FGC haven't actually published the specifications of this test, but they're saying that the read length of the fragments is at least a thousand base pairs, possibly longer. So this, is, this isn't the same as, the, um, as what I'm talking about here, but this will be a major step forward in um, uh, te sequencing testing, if only because those sequences which are being read will become much more reliable uh, once this becomes affordable to be um, mass marketed. So that's um, a run through um, approaching wide testing and uh, the possible future 
of, of SNP testing. Of course, SNPs don't just appear on the Y chromosome, they're on every Y chromosome. They're what you test when you do the family finder test, they're what you test when you do a mitochondrial DNA test. And in the long run, what I'd like to see is an integrated test in which we send in a sample and everything is done, SNPs, STRs, Y chromosome, um, autosomal and, and, and mitochondrial, all done in a single test. Of course, cost is a thing, but the future, I think, is, is on its way. So thank you very much, then, and uh, is there time for questions? Yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll have... Uh, thank you, John. Mm -hmm. We'll uh, have time for one or two questions. Uh, we have one question here at the back. Does, is there another question, then, as well? That, uh, well, let's go to the one at the back first, and then uh, we'll reconvene. Thank you, John. Um, could you go back to your uh, display of example one, the table panel that you had in example one, which showed a, an STR sequence uh, panel and with a number of uh, digits displayed in the table, where you represent the GDs involved in your table. Yes. That's it, yeah. Or something similar, an earlier one, yeah. Like uh, example one. Example one but it was my own um, yes, results. Yes, Gorman and uh, yes. Leary, it was uh, a table. That's imagine not, yeah. yeah. Um, just in reading that series of uh, letters or numbers, digits mm -hmm. at the bottom, the double digit uh, uh, SNP 1923, how do you measure GDs in a double uh, digit uh, cell, as it were? Do you read the differences between the first set of digits or the second set of digits or both? In the if there were differences in the 1923 on the middle of the table. Yes, in the case of this one, you'd, re you'd read both. So the, these are double ones are multi-copy markers. The same marker exists in two places on the Y chromosome. And they are, they are different markers, but they can't be sure which one is, is in which position. Um, and so um, they are separate markers. You would read these as two separate markers. Um, but there's one of them, it's not showing here, the so-called CDY marker that I believe Family Tree DNA um, will read any difference in it. Is it here? Yeah, here it is, yeah. So if, if there was a 35-35, a that would be read as one difference in this particular marker only. But um, most of the, um, the multi-copy markers, you read each one as being one difference. Yeah. I have a question here from James. Not so much a question, John, as you might expect a, an observation, uh, but thank you for such a, a comprehensive overview. Two points you didn't pick up that I, I expected you, you might do and, and might, might like to comment on. First of all, the vast improvement that STDNA made um, about four or five months ago in the haplotype, which has meant that for big Y um, test results and for the panel test, they now have a haplotype that is up to date and means that the uh, value for money you get for these tests is vastly enhanced. Uh, the old fun and games of going through band data, I suspect, is now redundant. I wouldn't, not completely, but, but uh, for many people it's unnecessary. Um, you, you might like to comment on that. The other one is specifically on the panel tests, which you didn't go into very much. Yes, absolutely, of course, they don't identify new SNPs. They can only confirm SNPs that have already been identified by Big Y. But one surprising result I find is that they, they identify the existence, though not the identity, of other SNPs, more sons, from negative results. If you, if you get um, mm -hmm. um, you, your noddings, you know them, yep. and even some of the audience don't. Mm -hmm. And that has turned out to be in a vastly um, uh, exciting mm -hmm. area uh, in, a, in a small particular interest. But the value of the, the panel test is much greater than, than I'd anticipate. Again, you might like to comment on that. Yeah, I, I agree absolutely. If you um, do a panel test on someone who is closely related to you and have all your SNPs, then they will be quite closely connected to you and there are probably no more new SNPs to be found. If you do a panel test on someone who has your surname, it's probably a relative of yours and they share only, say, half of your SNPs, the chances are there are more there to be found. So that person, that could be worth putting through an MGS test to find those SNPs. So yes, it's like a flashlight or a beacon that shows where there are gaps in knowledge and where, where new SNPs can be findable. Um, the first point about the haplotree, I agree absolutely, family tree DNA have made huge improvements to their support for Big Y this year. The improved haplotree is one thing they're working very hard at getting all significant SNPs discovered by project administrators onto, onto the haplotree so people can see an accurate read of where they are. They can actually find 
their terminal SNP now by tracking down through that through the, the haplo tree. I think it does depend on how active the haplo group project is. So R1B, very, very active, a very excellent haplo tree. I don't think it's quite so good for R1A, which I work within. I tend to recommend people to go to wifel.com who are doing something similar. Wifel.com are rather deficient in the R1B side of things, but they are the place to go to for, for R1A reference. So it's also the courses as well. James, yeah. I, I differ on you. To give them credit, they got there before I did with my one. So it wasn't my team. All right. They, they discovered it. Yeah. Um, good, good. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Great. Well, we have to uh, stop it there, unfortunately, because we've run out of time. But um, uh, the, please show your appreciation for John Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll take a short break, and then we come back uh, for the O'Brien, uh, the DNA of the O'Brien plan. Ooh. That's my first time lifting something like that. <laughs> 